All right, loading. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. For those who are just tuning in for the first time this month, we are taking a deep dive into the issue of ocean plastics. So some of you may already know that uh, 8 million tons of ocean plastic are entering our ocean each year. That's the equivalent to about a dump truck every minute. So it is a big problem. It is a problem we need to find solutions for, and we need to do it at a global level. So all month long, we've been connecting with scientists, explorers, and artists who are researching the issue, shedding light on the issue, as well as looking for solutions that we can use in our homes uh, and in our classrooms. So before we meet Imogen today, I want to take a quick moment to give a shout out to our classrooms who are starting to tune in live via YouTube. Uh, don't forget that you can get on the action. On the right, there's a chat sidebar. Send us some questions. Let us know where you're watching from. And then to any classroom, whether you're tuning in live on camera with us or you are viewing on YouTube, take some pictures, uh, share them to Twitter, use the hashtag Explore Classroom and tag at Nat Geo Education. We love to see pictures of classrooms in action. All right, let's get to the main event. I'm really excited to be hosting Imogen Knapper. She's a marine biologist and a National Geographic Ocean Rescue Scholar. She developed a love for the ocean at a young age when she learned to sail and surf in her seaside home of Bristol uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, once she began noticing the effects of plastic on beaches, her passion arose to try and do something to solve that issue. So she's completed a PhD in marine science at Plymouth University, focusing on sources of plastic uh, in our ocean environments. And her work recently helped influence a ban on microbeads in cosmetics internationally. As well, her research now is looking at different fabric types to try and understand how plastic fibers are coming off our clothing and then getting uh, into our uh, waterways. So Imogen, it's so great to be stealing some of your time today. We've got a great group of classrooms from across North America and uh, we're looking forward to some Q&A action uh, a little later as well. Awesome. Um, hello everyone, I'm delighted to be with you today. And I think over seven classrooms with us, which is really exciting. I can't wait to share some of my research and hear about your questions at the end. So Joe, is this where I switch over to my PowerPoint? Absolutely, we're ready. Brilliant, hold on one second. And then hopefully, oops, you can go back to the beginning. Okay, can you see it? We got it, you're nice and full screen. Okay, brilliant. So my research is really looking at plastic and how it's getting into the ocean. But what really interests me is investigating the not so obvious. So how is plastic getting into the ocean from ways that we would never typically consider? But let's start right back at the beginning and remember what a plastic is. And as its most basic components, plastic is carbon and hydrogen. And that's called a monomer, what you can see on the screen right now. And imagine a monomer like a Lego brick. If we were to put all of these Lego bricks together, all of these carbon and hydrogens, it creates a polymer. And this is the very basic structure of a plastic. And it's this structure, this polymer, all of these Lego bricks together that can make some really wonderful materials that have revolutionized our lives. And that can be carrier bags, shampoo bottles, toys, phones, even things that protect us. So it really is a wonder material. And the first synthetic man-made plastic was invented in the early 1900s and it was called Bakelite. And um, Bakelite was used to make radios. And to show that it still works, my nana, my grandma still has a Bakelite radio today. And this really boomed the whole plastic age. We can see plastic around us all the time. So it started with polystyrene after Bakelite, which you'd often see to make coffee cups, single-use coffee cups, then polyester, which makes our clothes, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, which makes really hard pipes, polythene, which makes our water bottles, and also nylon, which is the bristles of our toothbrush. And I want you to look around your classroom right now and just see how much plastic is in there. It could be your clothing, the carpet, the computer you're watching this on. 
Uh, it could even be parts of a mobile phone to pens. It's really everywhere. But it's a victim of its own success. And this is a picture from something called Life magazine. And this is in the real mist of when we thought plastic was a fantastic material, especially for single use items. And this family are throwing all of these single use items in the air because they're so excited. So have a look to see what you can find. I can see plates, spoons, cups. There's a lot of single use items there. But like I said, it's a victim of its own success because now a lot of these single use plastic items are making their way into the natural environment. And we're almost treating our natural environment like the ocean, like a rubbish bin. But how did it all get started for me? Well, it is me when I was three or four years old with my dad. And I was really lucky that I grew up in a seaside town called Clevedon, which is in the southwest of England. And I've always had this massive love for the ocean. I just love being there and feeling its healing properties. And one of my most favorite things to do was to draw in the sand. And I'd take a pebble or a stone or a stick or a shell, and I could draw in the sand for hours. And I used to love drawing pictures of animals or trains. And I think in this picture, I'm actually drawing a train. But I never remember any plastic on these beaches. Well, fast forward 20 or so years, and unfortunately for a lot of us, this is what we're seeing. And this is a beach near me in Cornwall, because at the moment I live in Plymouth. And my dog is in the top of the corner called Rhubarb, and I took him for a walk on Easter Sunday. And I didn't expect there to be any plastic on the beach, but it was just after the storms. And unfortunately, it looked like multicolored confetti all over the sand, tiny bits of plastic covering the beach. And when I was younger, in my past photo, I don't remember seeing any plastic on the beach because if I did, I'd have recruited it to be one of my paintbrushes to draw my drawings in the sand. But here you can see it's just everywhere. So from my beginnings of drawing in the sand, now I'm a marine scientist focusing on the sources of plastic getting into our environment because I really want to see and be a detective of how it's getting there. So my research that I've done at university looked at the sources of plastic into the marine environment. And when we typically think of the sources, we might think of litter dropped in towns or cities, litter dropped at the beach, or even shipping materials lost overboard. But I wanted to investigate the plastic that's getting into our oceans from ways that we wouldn't typically always consider. So my first piece of research was looking at facial scrubs. Uh, facial scrubs used to contain tiny plastic beads called microbeads, and they were put into facial scrubs to act as exfoliants. So you'd wash your face and these exfoliants would get the dead skin off. But no one knew how many microbeads could be in one bottle. And remember that these are plastic. So you can see all of the different types of facial scrubs here. And the glass file at the front of the bottle shows how much plastic was in that facial scrub. So from our research, we found that up to 3 million tiny plastic beads could be in one facial scrub bottle. So when a squirts on your hand, there could be up to 10,000. So imagine you would be washing your face with tiny plastic particles, which would go down the sink, through the drain, and then potentially through our sewage treatment works and into our oceans making it a big plastic soup. But what was exciting about this research? Well, it was really exciting to see how research can make a change because it made people discuss that plastic could be in our facial scrubs and taught us that people like you and me can make a change and we have a voice and a choice. So people started to not use these products and use natural alternatives instead. Then industry started to also listen and they started banning microbeads in their own products because they realized it was very unpopular and it was making people really angry. And then governments around the world listened as well. And our research influenced governments around the world to ban microbeads and facial scrubs. So it was really exciting as a scientist to see how my science was making a change in the world. And I went back two years later to test the same products that I tested previously and all of them had removed plastic from their products, which was a great success. 
My next bit of research is looking at washing our clothes. And I want you to look at your clothes right now because most of them are made out of plastic. Can you imagine that you're wearing plastic right now? Because when I think of plastic, I think of a pen or a plastic water bottle or something really hard, but not my fluffy jumper. And to prove a point, this is made out of plastic. And when we wash our clothes in the washing machine and they're swishing and swirling about, tiny fibers can come off our clothes and like the microbeads, go down the drain, potentially through the sewage treatment works and then into our oceans, making our oceans a big plastic soup, potentially full of microbeads and fibers. But I wanted to do research looking at different fabric types and how many fibers were coming off in a wash cycle. So I can imagine that you're thinking of a typical lab as white lab coats and people looking at test tubes. But on the screen right now, this is my lab. And this was my washing machine. And we very much have a love-hate relationship because I did over 200 hours of washing clothes. But I got some very interesting results. So the things that we tested were polyester jumpers, acrylic jumpers, and also polyester cotton blend jumpers. And we washed them in the washing machine. And this is what we found. So for a typical wash that you would do at home, about six kilograms, if I was to wash a load of polyester cotton blend jumpers, about 130,000 fibers would come off our clothes per wash. For polyester, it was more at 500,000 fibers, and acrylic the most is 700,000 fibers. So imagine when you go home and you do the washing of your clothes, up to 700,000 fibers could come off your clothes, go down the drain and potentially into our oceans, making it a big plastic soup. Now imagine that for your street, your town, your city, the whole world, that's a huge proportion of fibers going in to our environment. But what was my next bit of research? And this is my most very recent research that came out in the last year. And I decided to test biodegradable and compostable plastics. Because people, when they hear the word biodegradable and compostable, we often think that if they're in the natural environment, they'll disappear in a really quick time frame. So I decided to test this. And I tested a number of bags from really top shops in the UK. And I cut these bags into strips. And then I sewed the bags into this mesh structure. And as you can see here, this is us in uh, the lab, sewing them in and getting them ready for deployment. And then from these bag strips, I also deployed whole bags as well, just to see how they would deal in these environments. I buried them in the soil. And here you can see some of the strips just about to get buried. And some of the whole bags as well. I hung them outside uh, so they would get sunlight and all of the weather that would come with being outside. And I also submerged them in the sea. So this is the setup for the bags that are about to go into the ocean. So you can see the strips there and also the whole bags. And you can see the boats on the left and then you've got the pontoon and the water to the right. That's where I submerged the ones that were going to go into the marine environment. And I left these bags here for over three years. So the whole bags and the strips. And I analyzed the deterioration over these three years. But I took out samples at nine months, 18 months, and 27 months. So I could have a look at how they were breaking down. And this is me pulling out some of our samples after nine months. And it got really heavy because it turned into a zoo of animals and seaweed. So it took ages to try and pull out these samples because they were just a giant mass of animals, which is really exciting to see. And as you can see, you can see lots of sea squirts and crabs, uh, lots of seaweed as well. And I had to dig through them to get back to my samples. You can also see the red things there, which are starfish. I also had to dig them up. So I pulled them out of the ocean and I had to dig them up after nine months. And I also had to look at their breakdown for the ones that were outside. So what did we find? Well, for the ones that were outside, all of the bags after nine months turned into tiny, tiny pieces, which we call microplastics, which are plastics less than five millimeters in length. 
And that's because it's getting something uh, from sunlight. It's being oxidized. It means it's getting heat and that oxidization, which is needed to turn this plastic into tiny bits. It doesn't mean it's completely disappearing. It just means it's going into tiny bits. But for the bags in the sea, all of the biodegradable bags tested were still there after three years. So I don't know about you, but if I heard the word biodegradable in the natural environment, I would assume it would disappear in weeks, not three years. But the compostable one in the ocean did disappear within three months. And the scary thing is that these biodegradable bags could still hold, after three years, a full bag of shopping. And it was a very heavy bag full of beans, bananas, pasta, cereal, drinks. So it was a very heavy bag. But here I am holding that bag that's been in the ocean for three years and it's still a functional bag three years later. As you can see, that's me pretending that I've just come from the shops. Uh, biodegradable and compostable plastics are a solution, but a solution in their own circle where they might need to go to an industrial composter, which has really high heat and really high moisture that's needed to break down the materials. But we need to have better labelling and understanding of these materials because we're finding that for some of these plastic types, if they're in the natural environment, they're not behaving any differently to normal plastic. So looking at all of my research from microbeads and cosmetics, from washing our clothes, and also looking at biodegradable and compostable bags, it's created a lot of discussion and a lot of media attention. And this is fantastic because it's teaching people like you and me that we have a choice and we have a voice and what we are doing does affect the ocean. By choosing a microbead free facial scrub, we could be stopping three million tiny microbeads from going in the ocean. From washing our clothes less regularly, we're stopping 700,000 fibers potentially reaching the ocean. So it's up to you guys now to be plastic detectives and to go and spread the knowledge about plastic in the environment and know where you fit in. I'm really excited to now be finishing my research with National Geographic and Sky Ocean Rescue, where I've been testing different inventions that will be going into the washing cycle to try and capture the fibres. Um, I wonder if I can show you, actually. I'm actually in my lab, and here you can see my washing machines. And that's where I've been doing all of the testing recently. So watch this space, because we're about to say the results very soon about which inventions are really effective at capturing the fibres. And that's me sat on top of my washing machine so you can get a better view of them. And I'm also really delighted to be joining National Geographic, where I've been travelling on the Ganges, for, all the way from Bangladesh and India, all the way from sea to source. And I'm part of this wonderful team of Bangladesh, Indian, UK and American scientists, storytellers, educators that are going on this journey so we can better understand how plastic is getting into rivers because all rivers lead to the ocean and we want to find solutions. So I want to leave you now with just something that I want you to remember and this mosquito is made by a friend and artist of mine called Rob Arnold and it's made out of beach litter. So you can see you have lollipop sticks, uh, earbud sticks, they have an inhaler which is making the main body of the mosquito and also a part of a bottle. But why is this important? Well I want you to remember that you can make a difference and if you think you're ever too small to make a difference try sleeping with a mosquito. Thank you. All right let's see if I can get off this share. And right. um, do I answer any of your questions? Perfect you are back. That was awesome, Imogen. Thank you so much for sharing that research. And I think you definitely have a lot of wheels turning in the classrooms because you hear things like compostable and, and, and such, and, and you think uh, you're doing the right thing, but not always. Sometimes it's special situations where things work. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. It's a pleasure. All right. So before we meet some live classrooms, I want to give some shout outs on YouTube. We have a whole bunch of classrooms tuning in on YouTube, like Mrs. Clark's fourth graders in Florida. Uh, Mrs. Gunn's students, sixth graders in Indianola, in Ohio. Um, who else? Uh, Trina, sixth graders in Columbus, Ohio. We've got Edna High School uh, joining us in Minnesota. We even have groups joining from Peru and Chile. We've got Miss Pina's fifth graders in Hoboken, New Jersey. So we have lots of great classrooms joining us from all 
uh, different locations. So we're gonna work in some of their questions, but for now, let's go to our live camera classrooms. So let's start off. Let's go to Mrs. Feeney's group. They're hanging out with us in Massachusetts. Let me get their microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Massachusetts? Good morning. Hi. Hi. Really good. So good. Really good. Mm -hmm. All right. Who's got a question? All right, Ollie. Go ahead. My mom just loads the laundry four times a week, and I'm in a family of five. How many fibers do you think comes off our clothes every week? Oh, that's a really good question. So for a family of five, you'd be having some really big load cycles, washing them four times a week. Oh, easily, you could be having millions of fibers coming from your clothes that potentially could be going into the oceans every week. So it's a huge proportion. So what we need to do is look at inventions that can try and capture them, look at how we can try and make clothes differently so they shed less fibers and also wash our clothes less. So only wash your clothes when you need to because that's gonna stop fibers from coming off your clothes in the first place. But great question. All right, breaking out the math early and throwing some numbers at you. All right, great question. Let us go now to Mrs. Robinson's group. They're in Petawawa, Ontario, here in Canada. Looks like some grade five sixes. Let's get that microphone on. How are we doing, Ontario? Good. Good. What other methods are there to make I heard the question and again a really good question I think the best method for me is education because if we can stop plastic from getting into the ocean in the first place that's the most effective and that's what we need to work on uh, in terms of getting plastic out of the ocean that's already there um, you can go and join local beach cleans and again I think that's really important for the educational piece because you can learn what's actually going into the ocean and how you can pick it up but try and use just less single-use plastic. Have you got a reusable water bottle? Have you got a, a reusable cutlery? It's all about starting small and then building up. All right, excellent question and an excellent point. Um, I think we get too carried away sometimes with uh, how can we clean up, how can we clean up? Well, it's just like a bathtub. If your bathtub's overflowing, you're not gonna mop the water at the bottom. You're gonna turn the tap off first and yep. then worry about the cleanup afterwards. So awesome question. Uh, let's grab one question from YouTube. Let's see, Mrs. Pina's class, they are wondering about the closed fibers and the microbeads. Can you think of any species in particular that those might affect? Uh, well, it could affect anything that's in the ocean because they're so small. Imagining all of the whales or even plankton, when something's that small, they might mistake it as food or they might also accidentally eat it. And then once it's at the bottom of the food chain, if I've got a plankton that's eaten a fiber, then a fish comes and eats that plankton. And then something even bigger comes and eats that fish like a shark. And it's going up and up and up. So it's really affecting everything that's in the ocean. And we're finding it all the way on the sea surface, all the way to the sea floor, even in sea ice in the Arctic. So it's really everywhere. And how do you try and remove something that's that small? So we need to, like Joe said, turn off the tap rather than mopping up the floor. All right, keep those questions coming online. Let's go to another one of our live classrooms. This time we'll visit Mrs. Holmes' class. They are joining us in Missouri, uh, grade seven students. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Missouri? Oops, that didn't work. Let's try that again. Mrs. Holmes, your microphone's not cooperating with me at the moment. Do you mind trying to, oh, there it goes. Hi there. Hey, Missouri. Hi. So I was wondering, have you ever tried like sorting the plastic on the beach and seeing what's like actually on the beach? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I have a good friend of mine that's done some research looking at beach litter and what different types. 
Um, and it's really important to go down to the beach or even a park or anywhere outside and just have a look at the litter that's there. So in Cornwall, where I live, I find a lot of the litter could be from bathroom products. So people cleaning their ears with the uh, ear sticks and then chucking them down the toilet. Wet wipes, because wet wipes are typically plastic and they flush those down the toilet. We also find a lot of bottles because they float. Um, we also find some Lego because in the UK, there was a boat and a container fell off the boat. It was full of Lego, uh, Lego pieces, which were flippers and uh, little tiny divers, which is quite ironic because it's linked to the sea. So it's almost a competition of who can try and find the Lego around the southwest of the UK. But it's really important to try and identify what different types are there because then we can target those types because we're aware that they're getting into the oceans in the first place. So example, wet wipes, we need to educate people uh, more effectively to learn that you shouldn't be flushing wet wipes down the toilet, they need to go in the bin. All right, let's jump to another live classroom. Mrs. Holland's group in Arkansas, 7th graders. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, 7th graders? Good. Good. All right, who's up? Okay. Um, like something you go into the field, is there anything that's still like you go in and it still amazes you? Like, the, the Can you just say that again? I did hear it, but I think you just cut out a little. Is there anything that you go into the field and you see a lot of and it still amazes you, like the birds that you saw? Is there anything that I could see? Like amazes you still that you're still seeing? Oh, um, in terms of plastic or in terms of the ocean? The ocean. Oh, um, the ocean. Uh, I mean, I would argue that everyone loves the ocean, and I love surfing. I'm a terrible surfer, but I try and go as much as I can. Um, and there's no better feeling than just being in the water. It's, it's so calming. You forget about any stress, and it's just so much fun. I think the thing that amazes me is that we still don't know so much about our oceans. And I think there's a fact that we know less about the deep sea and our oceans than we do about the moon, which is crazy because we live on this planet. So why, why don't we know much about this ocean? And the other thing that really surprises me is that it's such a beautiful place filled with such amazing animals and things that we haven't discovered yet, but we're treating it like a rubbish bin. And we're finding so many tiny bits of plastic and large bits of plastic in the ocean. And if this is happening on the beaches that are near me and you, it's happening all around the world. And this has really happened in our lifetimes. Uh, and we need to make sure that we stop it so it doesn't get worse. Yeah, I think uh, for a long time, we really thought that we could just put anything in the ocean. It was so big that it wouldn't matter. And that's really come back to haunt us is that uh, it, it does matter and it does have a big uh, impact when we put things into our ocean. So I'm going to grab a two-parter here from online. Mrs. Clark's group is wondering um, about companies, two things about companies. One, if they say something's biodegradable and it isn't, can they get into any trouble for that? And they're also wondering with things like wet wipes, do they have to label them as have, containing plastics? Really good question. So the first one is companies that are saying biodegradable and whether they actually are. Um, well, it's, it's still a really new piece of research and a lot of products recently are labeling themselves as biodegradable and compostable and they are a solution, but like I said, maybe a solution in a closed loop environment where they can get to an industrial composter. But I think we all need to just be singing from the same hymn sheet. So we're all just on the same uh, line that how does it get to an industrial composter is it actually compostable or biodegradable in the natural environment and if it's not then I'm fighting to try and get correct labeling and standards more education especially for the general public so we're more informed about what we're buying uh, or what we're getting um, so it's a very new fresh piece of research that's still up for discussion at the moment. 
Um, so I think watch the next few months to see how that develops and how biodegradable and compostable uh, label themselves. Um, and then for wet wipes, they don't specifically, I don't know if it's different in the US, label themselves as plastic, but you can always normally look on the back of the ingredients list and see what it's made out of. But the best telltale sign is if it's made out of plastic, it will say do not flush. But in my eyes, the do not flush should be a lot larger and more prominent, more obvious on the front of the packaging, because a lot of people, to no fault of their own, do put it down the toilet because they think it behaves like toilet paper. But unfortunately, that toilet paper is made out of plastic and will end up either clogging up the sewage treatment plants or going into our oceans. And I don't want to be swimming or surfing in the ocean with a wet wipe swimming next to me. Absolutely not. Uh, okay, let's see who we visited. Let's go to Mrs. Hendricks' group. They are in Tennessee, grade sevens. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Tennessee? <laughs> Ooh, big group in Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. All right, who's up? Can you say that slightly louder? <laughs> is plastic is a bigger issue, or is it just plastic that's all bad together? Is there any good plastic? Hey, it's a really good question. You guys are such a big group. Oh my goodness. Um, is there any good plastic? Well, uh, plastic is great. And it has completely revolutionized our lives. Like, can, can you guys imagine a world about plastic in terms of healthcare, the products that we get, food wrapping? It's a great material, but our problem is that we're just making so much of it. And there's so many different types of plastic, like polyester, acrylic, um, polyethylene. And that can make recycling of plastic really difficult because we've got so many different types and we color it and we jazz it all up to make it different. And when we're trying to recycle it to make it into a new plastic, recycling plants really struggle. But my opinion, we're just making too much plastic that's single use. I don't need to have my bananas wrapped in plastic when they've got their own protective layer. Uh, I don't need to keep buying water bottles that are in a plastic bottle because I have a reusable one. So it's almost really difficult because plastic is great. And I'm not, not going to say that plastic's great. It's a fantastic material that's so durable and can literally last a lifetime. But why are we making products that last for five minutes with a material that lasts a lifetime? So it's the way that we think about it that needs to change. A great question. All right. Uh, Mrs. Moore's class in Florida. Let's get that microphone turned on. There it is. How are we doing, Florida? Hey, what's up? You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, gotcha. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get on my knee. Okay. Can we reverse the damage that's been done due to the accumulation of plastic waste? Can we reverse the damage done due to plastic waste? Well, I'm an optimist and I'm going to say definitely. And the most important thing is just taking ownership of the problem. Unfortunately, this isn't a problem that's going to go away anytime soon. And I think we're going to live with it for our whole lives. But let's be that generation that really sees a significant change. I know around the beaches near me, we're starting to see less plastic on the beaches, especially really large plastic pieces. But I would love to go to a supermarket and see items that aren't wrapped in plastic anymore. Um, I, I'll try and go to the supermarket or try and go shopping and buy a meal or try and see if you can pretend to buy a meal that is just not got any items that are wrapped in plastic because it's really difficult and often really expensive. Uh, so not re realistic. So it is probable and it's definitely going to happen. We have to change the way that we use plastic because the ocean is such a big life source for us. I mean, every second breath comes from the ocean. So it's a large wake up call like climate change and the amazing Greta Thunberg as well. This is a wake up call that we need and that's why we need to act now. All right. Uh, back on YouTube, a few more shout outs to some classrooms who have just introduced themselves. We've got, uh, let's see, we've got a group joining us 
in Greece. That's pretty cool. Um, in Athens, we've got third graders in Pennsville, New Jersey. We've also got some students joining us in Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana. So lots of great students. And then this question's come up a few times from Trina's class as well as Miss Gunn's class. They're wondering about the uh, Sea to Source expedition. Uh, the first question is why India? And then is there plans to explore uh, other areas? Great question. Um, why India? Uh, well, India's got the Ganges and we really wanted to look at a major river system. And India is a really special place uh, because the Ganges is so holy, it's so spiritual. Um, they praise and they, they worship the, the Ganga, they call it over there. Um, so that's what made it such a special expedition for us. And we had partners in India and also Bangladesh we wanted to work with and really help develop and grow their own research labs so that we can leave a legacy piece so that that river can be cleaned up. I think the main thing is not thinking that India is the worst river, it's got the most pollution. All rivers have pollution in and from going out to India, I've seen some equally um, dirty plastic sites in the river uh, as the UK. So it really is everywhere. Um, but in terms of moving forward, we are looking at some new rivers and what we're developing is a rapid assessment methodology that can be used anywhere by anyone. Uh, so it's a really exciting time to be going to India and a really exciting time to be at the beginning of this research. All right. Uh, we have time to probably squeeze in a couple more questions. So I'm going to go, uh, let's go to Mrs. Holland's group, see if they have a follow-up question. So how do you avoid plastic from clothes that are famous brands like Nike and Adidas? How do you avo avoid them? Yeah, from clothes. Uh, I think everyone assumes because I'm a plastics researcher and I'm really, really fighting to stop plastic getting into the ocean that I must not use plastic at all. But it's unavoidable. It's sometimes natural products can be either really expensive or also environmentally damaging. So cotton, for example, uses so much water to produce. So what I'm wearing right now is plastic. But my top tip for you is still buy the items that you need, but don't be excessive. So don't over shop. I'm guilty as charged. I love buying clothes. And I've really had to stop myself, rein myself in from uh, buying all of these clothes. So it's just being aware of what you're doing and how you can make a change. All right, let's jump to Mrs. Moore's class and see if they have another question. My question is, what steps can be taken on a global level to regulate plastics and, and use waste control? Ooh, can you say that again? What steps can be taken on a global level to regulate plastic use and waste control? Uh, did you ask what steps can you take to stop plastic getting into waste or the ocean? I think wondering more about steps that we can take to regulate plastics globally. Oh, yeah. okay. That's a really good question. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, well, it's a three-prong attack. So one is us. We can make small changes in our lifestyle that can try and minimize our own plastic input. I don't need to buy another jumper. I've got a reusable coffee cup. I've got my reusable cutlery. I have a reusable water bottle. And I'm expected to have that for, you know, for life, hopefully, because it's such a great material. But then we've also got industry. Industry have to give us the choices so that we can make more sustainable choices with what we buy and what we use. But industry has to give us choices that are available to us and cheap enough for us to buy. And then also government has to enforce us and most importantly, industry to give us those choices. Like look at the micro bees and facial scrubs. Government around the world said, right, this is ridiculous. No more micro bees and facial scrubs because it is ridiculous. You're just putting plastic in facial scrubs when there are natural alternatives. So we all need to work together as people like you and me, industry and government. And it's quite confusing because there's not one easy answer. There's so many different answers. It's just learning where you fit into this giant puzzle. All right, and let's pop into Eagleton Middle School and see if they have another question. What tools do they use to remove microplastics? 
What tool do they use to remove microplastics? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, microplastics is really tricky because it's so small. I imagine you're in the ocean or on a beach. If I had a plastic carrier bag, that's quite easy to remove because I just pick it up. But how do I see a tiny fiber in the sand or in the sea? So at the moment, trying to remove microplastics from the ocean or the beach, I would argue, is not possible. It's too tricky. Um, I know lots of people are working on different inventions or different methods to try and do that. But the most important thing is stopping it getting in there in the first place because it's, it's impossible. All right. Well, Imogen, I know there's definitely more questions out there. Are you okay if they tweet some, if the classroom still have questions to tweet some more questions your way? Yeah, yeah, please do. Tweet away and I'll make sure I'll reply. All right. So on Twitter, you can find uh, Imogen at just Imogen Napper. So really easy. Uh, you should be able to track her down. So boys and girls, classrooms, I want to give you a huge shout out. Thank you for joining us today, both on YouTube and in the classroom. Thanks for all your awesome questions. Um, if you want some more ocean plastic action, we're connecting with Justine Mandolia at 1 p.m. Eastern today. So feel free to join in on YouTube for that one. Um, and Imogen, thank you so much for taking some time to hang out with us today, share your research and, you know, a little bit of a message of hope as well is that we, we can do something about it. We just have to work together. Yeah, thank you so much. It was so much fun. And if anyone has any questions, please just tweet me or email me. I'm more than happy to answer. All right, let's turn on those microphones, boys and girls, nice and loud. Big goodbye and thank you. And we'll sign off for today. <laughs>